Welcome to Releasing Your Inner Dragon, where story creators talk story creation. Drake is an award-winning fantasy novelist and creative writing teacher. You can find his epic fantasy series, The Genesis Oblivion, on Kindle Vela. Marie runs a fantasy world-building channel called Just In Time Worlds, and her first book, The Hidden Blade, is available on Kindle Unlimited. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Drake and Marie. Today, we are having a practical editing episode. We were sent a piece of text to edit. If you would like us to edit your work live and on this podcast, you can send your thousand word snippet to releasingyourinnerdragon at gmail.com or one word. Before we get into today's episode, please do hit the subscribe button or add us to your favorites in your podcast app, join our mailing lists, share this episode, all that good stuff. Very important. Okay. I want to add one thing to that. Um, Mm. When you do send us a piece of work for us to edit, do realize we're not actually going to edit your work like we would if we were hired to edit it. What we're really looking for is a couple really great examples of not how to do something. And then we're going to spend the entire time talking about how to fix that and all of that. So it's not, it's not about fixing your writing. It's about using your writing because you're the average Joe and you make a lot of the same mistakes everyone else makes, which is what both of us made before you learn not to make those mistakes. So it's, it's not about, Oh, look, they're going to give me a free editing for a thousand words. No, we're not most like last time. I don't think we got past the first two paragraphs in an hour. Um, we might get to the, you know, to the bottom of the first page in this. So even when you send us a thousand words, we probably won't ever even get to it. So I just, I don't want to have false expectations because we're not editing. We're, we're just taking the biggest things and things that are very interesting that a lot of people miss. And then using that as an example to kind of use that as a teaching opportunity. Exactly. We, we take, we take that thousand words and we critique it and we look for the teaching opportunities. Okay. Oh, um, just as well, we will, as we did with this one, change all of the names in the text and so on in order to ensure anonymity. So the person who sent it to us knows about it and will receive our feedback on email as well. But the text has been changed to. Well, the story is true. The text is, or the the names have just been changed to protect the guilty. So. This is going to be a grammar heavy. Uh, If you're listening to us on the podcast, we're going to try our best to make sure that we are very, very descriptive in everything that we're doing verbally. But I would highly recommend this is the one episode that since we share the screen and we go through the text and all of that, this one works really well on YouTube. So if you haven't checked us out on YouTube, you know, look us up, link will be in the description down below, and then you can watch this episode. You can actually watch, you know, watch along with us and read along with us as we're going through this. You can also just search for Releasing Your Inner Dragon on YouTube and you will find our channel. Well, there you go. Okay, so let me read the first sentence. It says, Jane couldn't contain her excitement. How do you plan to get over the cliff? When are you leaving? What do you need? And then there is a dash, which we will talk about. Right. Then there's another dash that starts the next line of dialogue and it says thou hast seen proof of her work mr anderson mr black cut in his accent was harsh formal and old-fashioned he had a deep voice that fit the guttural accent what of her certificate of citizen black thou art sure she be as she spake so let's stop there let's kind of dissect some of this so in the last podcast We talked about opening lines and what you really have to do to kind of set the scene, the hook, um, you know, showing some type of conflict that's interesting that makes us want to continue reading that page. But it's also vitally important to set the scene. When you start a scene, the reader doesn't know anything. It's a blank slate. I read the the whole first page and I have no idea. I'm I'm in a blank void in this chapter, but it is vital to make sure that the reader sees what's going on. Cause, cause in this first page, really all of these people are, I don't even really see their body because it's never described. So really they're just lips hanging in a black void and words are coming out 
of their lips. And so I don't, I need to see this stuff. And I also need to feel it. And we're going to talk about that too. But it is vitally important. And I guess we should say that this was sent to us, obviously, as a portion within the within the novel. So it's it's possible that all of the descriptive work has been done. But even so, you want to work in to the text and the prose, descriptive elements and reminders of where they are. Otherwise, you turn into talking head dialogue. And nobody likes talking heads. Yeah, exactly. So dialogue for me, because I don't use speech tags and I only use action tags. Uh, and action tags is a kind of a misnomer because they're not always action in action tags. You're right. It could have been, you know, before. And I'm just going on. I'm, I wanted to just the reason why I should have said that beforehand. But the reason why I did it that way is I wanted to pretend this is where it starts. Because it, it's kind of obvious that it doesn't start here because it says Jane couldn't contain her excitement. And you're like, excitement over what? what's going on but i wanted to to broach it this way so that we can discuss setting the scene so that's why i said if you look at the note it says set the scene i have no idea where i'm at or what's around me um until and i i left it blank because i was gonna come back here and edit it when i got to the line that it actually started showing me where i was at but i never got there so i never came back and edited this note um so if this is the starting of a scene vitally, vitally, and vitally important that we are making sure the reader knows where we're at and whose head we're in. That's another thing is, you know, I didn't get down, I didn't get into the person's head until. I mean, Jane couldn't contain her excitement is generally kind of in the head of the person. True that, true that. Because you, that wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to do that if you weren't in their head. Right. I mean, technically you could also get away with it it's just a bad tell yeah. um so if it's a secondary tertiary character you can only do what they say and 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 do so this could also be an author's way of going jane danced from foot to foot you know obviously holding you know back everything she wanted to ask or something like that and she could be a secondary character so that's 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 what i'm worried about with this piece because i have no context i have nothing mm. before it so Jane couldn't contain her excitement. If this is the opening scene, I have no idea 100% yeah. that we're in Jane's head. You are correct. It could have already been set up beforehand and, and we're going and, and that's great. Even still, one of the most important things about a dialogue scene is making them action packed and making them visceral and making them immersive. And so many people fall into the trap of I'm just going to have these characters talk about this subject and I need them to talk about this subject because that's what the author needs or the, the reader needs. And they totally forget that you can lace in amazing prose into that dialogue. You can, you know, and we're, we've got a couple, I got a couple examples in here. So you can add emotions, you can add scene, you can add. You can add body language. Um, you can add scenery you can add world building elements characteristics you can have one of the characters have a repetitive gesture that comes out when they're nervous you know so you can really you can do a lot in between dialogue and it allows you to break up that tiring kind of people talking people talking is can be very tiring to read if the scene just carries on and on this goes back to i mean this is one of my drakeisms but, and this is why it exists because of reasons like this. So what I always say is when you're writing a novel, you're actually writing two novels at the same time and you don't even realize it. You're writing one on paper, but simultaneously you're writing one in your head. Yeah. And the problem with that is, is that you don't realize that they're two separate things. So in your mind, when you're rereading your own stuff, everything that's in your head book you just assume or, or just put in the book book, which is why critique groups are so important and beta readers are so important because then you can give them just the book book. You can't give them your head book. So looking at this, I see that you made a specific note there about the M dash, which I think is something that a lot of authors don't know about. So first of all, these aren't M dashes. Exactly. I was They're about dashes. to say that. Th those are hyphens. Right. An M dash is literally double the length of a hyphen, generally speaking. So in Word, the shortcut for it is Control-Alt-The-Minus sign. 
or if you want to make it in any other software, you can put two hyphens next to each other to indicate the M dash. But having a hyphen when what you meant is an M dash is problematic. <laughs> ah. So I didn't know that shortcut. I don't use the shortcut. That's not how I do it. I might start using it though. That's kind of that's kind of nifty. You're welcome. <laughs> it is not the minus on the row of keys at the top. It's the minus on the number pad. Yes. So I guess if you don't have a number pad, you're just up a creek without a paddle. Then if you don't have the number pad, there is one that it is, but I don't know which key it is because I don't use an English keyboard. So, <laughs> so notice the difference between these, the, the hyphen or the dash after need is very short and the M dash is much, much longer. Hmm. How I make them is as I'm writing along and I, you know, I need an M dash now here, um, I would do space two dashes. And then depending on what's going on, like if this is the end of the sentence, so like if this isn't, um, and we're going to talk about what an M dash at the end of dialogue is, but if I'm using it in that way, I'll go A space and then backspace twice. And it, it doesn't create the huge long M dash, but I don't know, it's just the one I use. And I don't even know really what the difference between the really long M dash and the shorter M dash is, but it's still twice the length of a, of a hyphen. The one that you create with the shortcut key, it looks like it's about four times the length of a hyphen. But either one, just be consistent with it throughout your manuscript. In dialogue, an M dash shows a interruption of speech. So there's a couple of things about that. First of all, we don't have to use a speech tag that says Mr. Black cut in because you have one piece of dialogue that doesn't finish. And then another piece of dialogue starts immediately after that. So the reader already knows that you're cutting in. So if you go, what do you need? Thou hast proof of her work, Mr. Anderson. And so me as the reader is going, oh, that's rude. He just cut her off because the punctuation shows it. And that's why I'm such a punctuation, you know, cop or whatever you want to say. Punctuation is not there for you. Because I, I hear this all the time, especially in the uh, indie publishing world, where they you all know, say, why did you use this punctuation for that? And they'll go, because I like it. I don't like it the way the industry uses it. I'm sorry, punctuation is not for you. It's for the reader. It's a standardized set of codes that everyone has agreed means something. So quotes mean dialogue that's said out loud. If you change that, then you actually confuse your readers and they don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing with this. So you can train them that, hey, I'm using this punctuation different than the world uses it, but why? Just because you like it to look better? Like you're gonna, you're gonna literally make every reader have to bend to your will because you like it, the look of it better? I mean, that's silly to me. So you do really want to learn the punctuation and use the punctuation correctly. So an M dash at the end of speech, that's what it shows. It shows that it was cut off. Here's, I'm going to skip down to here. Uh, so we skip down a couple paragraphs and we're to an ellipsis. So the, the, line of, the line of dialogue is, if you wouldn't mind, darling. And then it has an ellipsis at the end of it. Now, an ellipsis indicates in dialogue a fading out of speech. I would not, I don't see how somebody could say, if you wouldn't mind, darling, as a fading out. Mm. Now, let's say... As they're saying this line, a demon appears behind the person they're talking to. And we want to show that this person is now not speaking correctly. That's great. But one ellipsis at the end wouldn't quite do it. I would probably do something like, if you wouldn't dot, 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 mine, dot, 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 darling, dot, dot, dot. It's not a great line for that, but, but I'm just using it as an example. So since it's so weird, He's obviously not paying attention to what he's saying anymore. Mm -hmm. And we're using the ellipsis to kind of paint that picture. Because the next line might be um, over XYZ's shoulder, you know, hateful red eyes were staring at him or something like that. And then the reader knows, oh, yeah, no, this thing did that thing. So it doesn't get an ellipsis here because I don't see how no. he's fading out of speech in this sentence. Also, that M dash at the top before thou hast seen, seen proof of her work, that M dash doesn't need to be there. Right. Because 
he's not interrupting. It, it's not a continuation, which you shouldn't do anyway. Yeah. That's another thing. I use a lot of action tags. Every piece of dialogue just, just has tons of narration mixed in with it. You know, my dialogue paragraphs are always really long because it's just more immersive. It, it just paints such a bigger picture. All that extra text makes you feel like you're a part of the conversation. When it's just word, word, you know, dialogue, 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 it's not as interesting. And, and, it, and like uh, Marie said earlier, they get bored. They get bored with all this di uh, uh, dialogue and no one's doing anything. So, you know, again, it's why a lot of the times if I know the scene is going to, the scene that I need to convey to the reader is going to have a lot of talking and no, no action. I usually would do it over food because if they're having a meal, there's so much going on, everything from other people coming up to, you know, maybe they're being served, maybe the stove's on fire, um, not necessarily like that because that, that interrupts it, but, you know, the water's boiling over, um, they can cut stuff and butter stuff and sip stuff and pass stuff. And, and it's just, there's so many different actions. Cause again, I don't use speech tags, which means I have to use action tags to make sure that the reader knows who said the dialogue. Cause I don't write Jane said, you know, however I'm going to do it. So like this, this first one is a action tag. So Jane couldn't contain her excitement, period. How do you plan to get over the cliff? There's no doubt in the reader's mind who said, how do, you get, how do you plan to get over the cliff? Because it started with an action tag with Jane's name in it. Yep. Jane couldn't contain her excitement. Obviously, everything else in that paragraph is going to be that. And, and matter of fact, in last night's writer's group, we, we spent a lot of time, because two of them had issues with this. We said, spent a lot of time on paragraph. This also comes back to punctuation, basically. I, I, don't, I, I see sentence structure and paragraph structure the same as periods and you know m dashes because it's it's we do it for the reason that it's it's a sign to the reader to the reader of what's going on so a paragraph contains every action and dialogue from one character in that one sliver of time so jane can't contain her action or excitement is kind of happening all in the same moment as then she's saying these words. So we're going to put those together because it is this little sliver of time when something happens different. We, you know, and it could, be, it doesn't have to be moving to a character. You know, maybe, uh, maybe she gets cut off here. What do you need? And it just depends on how you are. This may be a bad example. That's why I hate coming up with examples on the fly. Uh, Cause I was about to say the example would be uh, a loud bang echoed uh, from the other room technically maybe you should do that as another paragraph but i probably wouldn't because it's something that's affecting jane and so it's still her little sliver moment of time but there i'm sure i could come up with an example yeah. if i wasn't doing it on the fly where you would move into a second paragraph that was something happening maybe you're describing a horseman riding up and dust flying up i, I definitely wouldn't include that mm. in jane's paragraph when we move to another paragraph or when we move to another character, now that next paragraph is everything they say and do in that sliver of time. In other words, they're the only ones actually doing anything in, at this second. So the next paragraph is the next second. So, you know, that's how we divide up paragraphs. You do not put, and, and this person didn't, I'm just using this um, as an opportunity. You don't put Jane's dialogue and Mr. Anderson's dialogue all in the same paragraph. Yeah. Let's talk about that was. His okay. accent was harsh, formal, and old-fashioned. I spent a lot of time just on this one sentence because there's, there's two complete notes. So yeah. we'll go through these. As I always say, was is always a red flag. Any of your you know, more passive verbs. And was gets really confusing because it can be a lot of different things. It can be passive voice. It can be a verb. It can be a... Um, the sky was blue. Linking verbs. It can be a linking verb. Yeah. So was can do a lot of things. And, and so can a, a couple other word, verbs like had and, and some other things like that. Had gets even more com uh, confusing when we're talking about that because it actually also deals with manipulating time. Mm. I, those words are always red flags. And that's why they're in my bad word macro. And if you don't know what my bad word macro is, I write in Word and I've been writing a macro for decades and I just keep adding to it. And it's personalized to me. It's things that I have found that I do wrong. Uh, like in the beginning of my writing career, I used just way too much. Like every third paragraph was the word just, and it's bad. And so what my bad word macro does is when I hit 
control alt shift B for bad word, it goes through and it highlights everything that I've told it to highlight in the colors that I've told it to highlight. So it highlights every was. Now, for the most part, I rarely change wases anymore because I'm, I'm over kind of that, but I still want to make sure. And the cool thing about highlighting stuff is you can't not see it. It jumps off the page. You know, I highlight all of my LY adverbs. So it highlights LY space. I highlight just, just a plethora of things. Not that I overuse adverbs anymore. I might only use an adverb every page or two, mm. but I still want to see because then what that does is it make it forces me to pay attention to it and, and read it and, and ask myself, do you really want that adverb there? Is, is, it, is it a good adverb for this? Could, could you rewrite it a little bit and make it a little bit more dynamic? And sometimes the answer is like, no, I'm too lazy. I'm that, that works. The door is just slowly closing and I'm fine with that because I could expand that and make that more dynamic, but it's just a door slowly closing and I don't want to expand it. Mm -hmm. So it stays, but it does force me to do that. So was should be one of those words that you should really pay attention to. Um, I'm actually working on a class. I'm writing it now. Uh, I'm going to record it hopefully soon now that I don't look like a corpse anymore after my treatment. But was is definitely one of, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, it's the entire class, the entire hour class is on the word was. It is, it is that important. And there's so much to, to think about what the word was. So here, the word was is a very weak verb that basically links his accent to being harsh, formal, and old-fashioned, which are three adjectives in a row. So yeah, so the, the subject is his accent. It's not him. It's his accent. The action is was. And that's why we're, we're saying that it's a weak verb because was is a, is a weak action. <laughs> you know, I was, you know, running, you know, swimming, jumping, whatever. Those are active verbs, whereas was is not an active verb. So that is your verb in this sentence. And so you want to kind of think about that. My, you know, I just, I just threw some examples in here. So like, uh, we could turn the, the sentence into a, what's called a simple declarative clause. Um, it's still overladen with adjectives and we'll talk about that. But so what I did was Mr. Black cut in his accent, harsh, formal, and old fashioned. So now the action, the subject is Mr. Black. The action is cut in, which are way more dynamic than was. And then everything else is what's called the simple declarative clause because it's declaring more information about the either the action or the subject. You know, in this case, it's describing his action. So it's, it's connected to him. So we're giving his accent and then kind of giving three adjectives for that accent. So that's why it's a simple uh, declarative clause. I think that I, th I think that I do want to comment here on the fact that you don't need the old fashioned. In the sentence above, Jane speaks in normal English, or at least what I would call normal English. The sentence below is obviously not normal English. It looks Regency. It looks Shakespearean. That being the case, you don't need the old fashioned. The reader doesn't, the reader's not that dumb. They can see that the one is, yeah, show, don't tell. Don't tell the prose what the dialogue accomplishes on its own. You do a great job of showing exactly that. So drop the old fashioned straight off the bat and the formal for that matter. Keep the harsh. So you skipped ahead of me one. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. The Drakeism that I've created that I use all the time is don't tell in the prose what the dialogue already shows. If I say thou hast seen proof of her work, I'm showing that he's speaking in a very outdated language. I don't then need to go. It's the same thing as the cut in. I don't need cut in if there's an M dash because the I'm showing with the M dash. And it's not, I mean, it's not the same thing as show, but it still works. But with this, we are absolutely showing that it's an old fashioned way of talking because the dialogue shows it. So we don't want to, and, and there's another example of that in here. Uh, I'm pretty sure, at least I know it was. I don't know if I actually called it out. Your goal is to make the dialogue show so that you don't have to write prose on it. And then you can use that prose 
to make the scene more dynamic or, or, or immerse the reader into stuff even deeper without having to tell them the way it's said. And some things, there's no, like the sentence, no. If you have dialogue, it says no. Like it literally says nothing about how it's said. So if, if it's being screamed, okay, maybe you can add an, an exclamation point to the end, but even still, is that strong enough or what I write, you know, she screamed at the top of her lungs or something like that. Because no, doesn't really, even no with an exclamation point. Mm. Um, did, did she whisper it? Did she like in those cases, and you always have dialogue that does not show how it's said. You, you can't write a, a conversation without having most of it be at least half of it, probably more than that, where the dialogue doesn't show how it's being said. But when you do have a piece of dialogue that shows what it said, you're done. You, you, you're done. You, 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 don't, you don't then tell how it's said. <laughs> for, for me, the key takeaway is if you've done all the hard work of showing me, it, or don't then tell me as well. Because at that point, you're saying that I wouldn't be smart enough to understand what you're showing me and I need to tell you as well, which is like, ah. Eh. What I think is really hard to get is a lot of writers don't even realize what they're actually doing. They think they're telling a story. They think they're describing scenes. The reality is you're conveying information. And, and I don't mean information as in describing a character or describing a scene. What you're actually doing is there's, there's reasons for this. So when we say a piece of dialogue, I like to ask myself, okay, why, why do I even write this piece of dialogue? What does the reader, because it's always for the reader. It's never for the other characters. Everything is for the reader because every, everything else is fake. Those characters aren't real. So I like to figure out what I am wanting to mean. So there's a lot of times if I struggle with a piece of dialogue or a paragraph, just I just don't really like the way it is and there's just something wrong with it and I can't feel it. I would take a step back and I go, okay, what's the piece of information that I'm trying to give to the reader? What am I trying to accomplish? I'm trying to accomplish that Jane is pissed. Boom, okay, now that I have refocused on the actual piece that I'm trying to give to the reader, I'm not gonna say Jane is pissed. But maybe I didn't, you know, maybe I was writing it and I still had, you know, no telling and it was all showing, but it still didn't make me feel like Jane was pissed, me, the reader. So because I wasn't quite locked into the fact of what am I trying to accomplish with this paragraph? What am I trying to accomplish with this sentence? So if you can take a step back from the work and don't look at it as a story, but look at it as each one of these things is giving something to the reader, a, a mm -hmm. item, you know, whatever. So ask yourself what are what am i trying to give to this reader and break it down to that very basic little element you know the whole paragraph what are you trying to say well i'm, I'm trying to convey that you know mr anderson's heart is broken okay great focus on that now rewrite the paragraph with the focus of i'm trying to show the reader that mr anderson's heart is broken if you don't focus in on the message that each sentence the message that each paragraph is trying to deliver the reader sometimes you can get lost in the weeds so that's where it goes back to the same thing if you can make your dialogue actually show the meaning which is in this case a descriptor he speaks in a very antiquated language if the dialogue accomplishes that we're done and you can literally just keep the harsh part which then becomes a descriptor of his voice you know i wrote this this sentence is a nightmare because and this is a weird way, but this is how I describe it. I describe sentences as the reader eating information. So you, when you start a sentence, you're, you're shoving stuff into the reader's mouth and they don't swallow until they hit the period. So when you have a lot of things in one sentence, like in this case, three adjectives, but it could also be, you know, actions. You know, I, I ran up the stairs kicked the guy in the face, jumped over the vault or, or vaulted over the railing and landed in a perfect 10 or something like that. That is a crap ton of things that are happening in the sentence. And the reader's not going to swallow until they get to that period. In other words, they're not going to consume all of what you've done and kind of put it in their brain um, movie. Same thing with a paragraph. The paragraph is another big swallow. I always like to say, this is where they take the sip of water between bites. So, it, you know, they're, they're kind of processing that information. And the problem with it is, 
when you shove that much information in, what you actually end up doing is they get nothing. They, 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 everything is weak. Like, so that sentence I just said, you know, Drake ran up the stairs, kicked the guy in the face, vaulted over the railing and landed in a perfect 10. They're really just going to walk away with, um, okay, so he did some acrobatic stuff. Like, there's no importance on the fight. There's no importance on the stairs. There's no importance on, you know, any of that stuff. And so it's all weak and they're going to take less information with them. So when you shove harsh, formal and old fashioned into one sentence, the writer thinks, hey, look at me. I'm, I'm giving all this detailed description of what the guy's voice sounds like or what his accent sounds like. But the reality is, is that you're risking the fact that readers are not going to walk away with all of it. They're going to, they're, it's just not going to make as big of an impact. So in the next paragraph or in the next uh, comment, I want to kind of break that down and kind of get away from the adjectives. So the first thing is it's, it's a tell. When you say was, you're, you're always, so like the sky was blue. You're telling me that the sky is blue. You're not showing me the sky is blue. You're telling me. Now, sometimes that's fine. You're going to tell, you know, if the sky doesn't matter to me and I just put it in there just to make sure that they know that the sky is blue and it doesn't affect the character and they don't have any emotions. They're not, you know, they're not whatever. I don't, I'm not going to waste word count showing the sky. I'm just going to say the sky was blue, but this is a lot more important. This is actually a character trait of one of the you know, secondary characters that is in the scene. So I don't want to just tell it. And, and also, you're giving all this information. So when you're giving that much information, we definitely don't want to tell it. So as I always say, how do we turn a tell into a show? Very simple. You ask a question. Now, that question varies depending on what the situation of the sentence is. So in this one, it's a sound. We're, we're telling what it sounds like. Which means the question is, what does an accent that is harsh, formal, and old-fashioned sound like? Whatever your answer is, is a show. Every time. You can't, if you answer that question, you can't do it in a tell. You have to do it in a show. Now, I didn't really give um, an example of this because I tried. I looked at it for a few minutes and I was like, yeah, there's just, there's too many adjectives here and they actually kind of, each have different jobs. And so I couldn't, like, I can't answer the question, what does an accent sound like that is harsh, formal, and old fashioned? I rack my brains. I actually pulled out even some of my thesaurus uh, books, and it's all blurry. Um, and just kind of, because I did, I spent like five or six minutes going, I got to come up with an example. And I was like, no, I can't. It's just, there's too much going on in here. So the alternative that is, which is what I talked about a second ago. Don't put that much information in a sentence. Break it up. I'm not saying don't tell me that it's, you know, don't show me that it's harsh or formal or old fashioned. You can do all of that. Just don't do it in one sentence. So uh, we talked about the verb. That's the second thing I talk about here. So was is the verb here and everything after we called the verb phrase. So the verb phrase is everything from was to old fashioned, which means the adjectives are describing the, the verb was. We want to you know, which, which weakens the adjectives. We want to really try to put our adjectives on nouns. That's what they're kind of designed for and that's what we want them to be. So if we break this up and kind of look at it different, here's, here's like an example that I did. His harsh accent echoed in the nothingness. The man's tone reminded Jane of her father's harsh, formal, but also old, like it hadn't been spoken for generations. Now, I did that to keep up with what's there. We've mm. already talked about, we don't need to even mention that it's old. But there's a couple of things here. So first of all, now you're, you're consuming things in these little pipes. You know, you're going, his harsh accent echoed in the nothing is swallow. The man's tone reminded Jane of her father, harsh, formal, swallow. You, you, the reader is going to literally remember this stuff and it's going to have more impact on the reader than, pos than, than shoving on one sentence couple other things that I want to show in here because I talked about why I use speech tags or you know, why I use action tags and not speech tags. All of these things are opportunities. So the first sentence, now I'm going to void. I have no idea where I'm at. So I'm just going to use that. And I'm going to say we are in a void um, because I haven't had any descriptors, but I also haven't had any descriptors that I'm in a void. I just have no descriptors. So the first line, his harsh accent echoed in the nothingness. I'm not only letting the reader know he has a harsh accent, 
I'm also describing what's around them in just a little piece. And that's the best way. I mean, some at the beginning of a scene, you're going to have to do a paragraph or two that is probably going to be all, this is what's around my character and this is what we're seeing and all that. But you don't, you can actually do less and then fill in more details through the scene as you're going through it. So I'm, I might've said that they were in a void, but that doesn't really ex, you know, make me feel what it's like to be in a void. So a line like this is now, you know, I already know I'm in a void and now it's like, oh, wow, the voice just echoes off into nowhere. That's, that's creepy or whatever. Mm. So one of the ways is, you know, always think about how can I bring in my setting, my scene. The other thing that's very, very, very difficult is, and this I did make up because I, I wanted to um, use this as an example. It's always about trying to make things personal to the, to the POV because you want to connect the reader to the POV at a very deep level. So that's why I used Jane's father. I don't know if it, I don't know anything about her father because I don't know anything about these characters, but by saying that the man's tone reminded her of her father, it's, it's making it personal. It's making that personal connection because when you're writing in a limited POV, third person limited, third person for your indirect discourse, first person, you are not telling the story. You're not even in the story. The character is telling the story. So what we want to look for, we don't want to describe this guy's tone. We want to describe how Jane feels about this guy's tone or hears this guy's tone. We don't want to describe a wall. We want to describe how that wall makes the, narr the narrating POV character feel or react or remember or whatever. We want to make it personal to her or even throw in, you know, the example that I use in my book um, is something from one of my romance pieces that uh, it's a statue. And so this girl, this girl's, and, and you get it through the entire narrative, but this is a great encapsulation of it. So she gets off this bus in town, it's set in modern day. And she's looking across the road and there's a cafe. And I said, uh, there was a wooden statue sitting on the front porch. And then the next line is, what even was it? An Indian, an old man, a child molester? She had no idea. Like throwing in the child molester word, obviously a statue is not a child molester. Like that's not going to happen. But it does bring in the fact that she sees the world in a very interesting way. And she's a very quirky character. And so that's one example. It happens all the time through her stuff. And it starts building a personality for this character without me telling. I never said, Jane had skated through her whole life being you know, snarky with everything she thought and said. I didn't say that. I don't need to because I'm going to everything she says and thinks, mm. I'm going to make it snarky whenever I can. And that's going to just show the readers that we've done that. So that's really what this is. Um, it's just breaking it down and looking for other ways. So not only are we breaking up our adjectives and I kept everything, but I also, cause now three sentences, so it's going to be more easier to consume. I brought in the environment. I brought in, you know, something to make it personal. Last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll move on to your head. And I'll let you take over for that one. Cause I've talked too much. The last sentence, but also like it hadn't been spoken for generations. That's not a sentence. It's a fragmented sentence. It's actually the entire sentence is a subordinate clause. So why did I do that? I broke the rule. In creative writing, you need to know the rules. You need to understand what you're doing. But you also need to understand, we're gonna talk about this in a second with Had too. You also gotta understand context. Readers understand context. So when I say, the man's tone reminded Jane of her father's heart or of her father's voice, harsh and formal, but also old. Like no one is going to misunderstand that, but also old is referring to the guy's voice. No one's going to misunderstand that, even though it's a fragmented sentence. Could I, you know, join it to it? Absolutely. I could, um, I could put a comma instead of a period and do a but, you know, the lowercase but. It's still a subordinate clause that doesn't change uh, either way. The problem is, is we go back to the original problem of too much information in one sentence. So the reason why I like to break things out every once in a while, and I do this, you know, it's not every paragraph, not, you know, maybe once a page, maybe not even that. But fragmented sentences are really powerful as long as the reader will not miss the context of what they mean. And there's not a single person that's going to read that sentence and go, 
but also old. What's old? What, what? Because the entire paragraph, again, is one thing that we're doing in one sliver you know, of this moment, and we're describing his voice. And so all of it is about describing his voice. And so no one is going to misunderstand that, even though I broke a grammar rule, because it also just reads well. It also sounds nice, you know, when you have, but also old, like it just, it's just another thing that makes me kind of see and hear what this guy is doing. Also by breaking it out, when you use a fragmented sentence, you actually strengthen the um, purpose of the adjective. So like a lot of times I will use fragmented sentences that are one word long, obviously not a sentence. You know, I might, I might write something. I hate coming up with examples out of my head because they're always crappy. Um, but I have one. Um, the, the woman said, I thought that it might be easier given your affliction, you know, speaking to like a crippled character. And then you can have the crippled carrier, crippled character or the, you know, um, have a response of a single word response internally affliction but that's so it, it is right 100 it's actually making sure but to me that's more of the letting the reader know how the dialogue that was said affected the pov because obviously the guy who says in his head afflicted yeah. we can't be in anyone's head but the pov so obviously the afflicted guy is the pov in that in that instance what i was actually talking about was like i might write um jane woke up in pitch blackness. And then I might write pain as the next sentence. And that, like I said, it's a bad example, but it, it just makes me stress this one moment. Um, I'd have to go into some of my writing because I, I cannot write out of my head. I have to be typing and I anyway. have to be in the moment. Yeah. Um, but that's what I mean. So yeah. what it actually does is when I use those in that way, I'm actually kind of strengthening or focusing something that is actually a piece of the last sentence. Mm -hmm. Um, to expand upon, but you're 100 right. The the answering in a dialogue in one word, especially an inner monologue, does show a lot because, like with your example, that POV now character is like, I don't have to write, you know, let's say POV's name is Drake. I don't have to write. Drake was really offended that the woman called him afflicted. I literally can accomplish that with a afflicted exclamation point uh, question mark either out loud, if he's that type of character, or in his head. If I want to convey that he's not going to say this to to the speaker, that's what we look for. We look for ways to show that Drake is offended by being called afflicted, yeah. without saying the word aff "afflicted" really, really made Drake feel sad. Yeah. Like we don't want to do that. All right, I'm done with was. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about had. So had again is a red flag word, generally speaking, which is not to say that it doesn't have its place. It does have its place, but- oh, You know what? Let me, let, me, let me jump in here. Yeah. I do want to go back to what's a second, just because of what you just said, because it reminded me. So we had this woman join our writers group a while, you know, she's been with us for about a year now, but um, in the beginning, every sentence had at least one was in it. Some of them had two. And so we got into the discussion about was, we talked about, you know, show, you know, doing all the different examples and everything like that. The next time she came back, then her next piece had no was in it, not a single one. But she didn't do it right. She literally just deleted the word was. So there were sentences like sky blue. That, that doesn't work. Sometimes you're going to have some was. Uh, and I love, I love this one because it was actually the very first piece of critiquing I was ever given in my entire life when I read at a writer's group. So we're talking decades ago. I stood up, I read my stuff. And the very first person that raised their hand, I called on them and they said, you use was a lot. Was is always passive. You should write with no wases. And I said, thank you. But in my head, I'm going, you cannot tell a story without the word was. I just, you know, there's no way. Now, he was right. I used them incorrectly. I way overused them. I didn't understand passive voice. I didn't understand all this stuff we're talking about. He was 100% right to pop me on it. He was wrong. And there's a lot of both teachers of writing and writers who believe you should not use the word ever. They believe this. Um, but there's a lot of crazy things. Uh, one of my, one of the people in my writer's group last night 
also goes to a writer's group from a guy who's got like 12 master's degree in English. And so he's very, very much, if you don't follow the Chicago manual style, it's wrong. And one of the other people had no exclamation point um, because she was showing that it was being screened. And this person was like, you're never supposed to use exclamation points in fiction. And so we got, and, and this is not the first time I've went round and around her with, on exclamation points, um, because it's in the Chicago manual style, she is correct, but it's creative is the first word in creative writing. So it's not about following the rules. It's about making sure the reader experiences the story. So to do anything like that, where you say, oh, I will never use a was, or I will never use an exclamation point, or like my stupidity, which I still cling to to this very day because it's the hill I'm, I wanted to die on, is I will never use a speech tag. It has caused me grief over the last 20 years. There's times where I would love to just say, Drake said, but no, I got to work something out and figure out something to do some type of action tag that is different from anything I've ever used before. Because I can't use Drake nodded, Marie nodded. Drake nodded, Marie nodded, Drake nodded, Marie nodded, because that is just a speech tag. That's just Drake said, Marie said. So the hardest part about using action tags and only action tags is literally, I have to come at, again, going back to why does it happen over meals? Because there's a crap ton of stuff that I can play with. Same thing with had, and, and now I'm going to kind of give it back to you, but it's the same thing. These rules, you need to know, and you need to follow them mostly. But like with my example of the fragmented sentence, mm. if it works, it works. And you don't have to go, oh, but it's a fragmented sentence. I'm going to have to rewrite this until I figure out how to make it right. No, you don't. So in this case, in this case, had is being used basically to attach the dude's voice to him. To him. So it's a, um, and you the alternative is on the screen, which is his deep voice fit his guttural accent. Actually, I don't think we read. You can lit. Okay, so the original sentence is he had a deep voice that fit the guttural accent. And you can literally just eliminate both the that and the had by saying his deep voice fit his guttural accent. So what we're doing is we're attaching the deep voice just directly to the noun, yeah. to him. And we're, when you say it had something, that means it, it is doing something on its own. So that whole thing is the verb in that. You know, had a deep voice is what's called a verb phrase. Actually, I think that's a verbal phrase. Verbal phrases get really, really confusing. And I don't even want to even touch those stupid things. But because of that, the deep voice isn't necessarily attached to the, the noun. So if you switch it around, you know, like she read, his deep voice. Now we're going, oh, he owns that deep voice. And it also, it also takes it away because had is the verb in that sentence. So he had, but had is a weak verb. So now we can actually go his, his deep voice fit. So the action is fitting you know, that's what it's doing. So his deep voice is, is the noun, fit is the verb. And so are the action. Yeah. And you can even have stronger verbs at that point. You can say his deep voice emphasized the guttural accent. Now, that being said, had has a very relevant place in time. So if you're writing your story in the past tense, your simple past tense is his deep voice fit the guttural accent. But let's say that he was that this was in the past of the story which is written in past tense so i like to explain you're writing in past tense but don't fall for the trap that it's already all happened mm. that past tense that you're writing in is happening right now because the reader's going to feel that it's happening right now as they read it so don't fall in the trap of, oh, I'm writing a past tense, which means everything's already happened, which means the narrating character already knows everything because they're at the end of the story. That's when you're writing in third person omniscient or, well, no, that is always in third person. Omniscient. I was going to say, or the, the, the narrating omniscient voice is the main character and has already gone through this. Like uh, the example I would always use because I love the book was um, Billy Crystal's, I think it was like 100 Sundays or something like that. I got it over there. I could look it up, but it's, it's basically him talking about his life. And, and his time with his dad and very, very great book. 
he is the narrator through the whole thing. And he lived through all of that already. He's much older telling the story. But even still, that's still happening in the now. Even though I know he's in the future, as I'm reading what he's saying, it is literally happening in the now for me. It is the now. It is the now of the story. So if you want to go into the past of the story, the tense you have to use is perfect. Past perfect. And past perfect is most often indicated with a had or a was. They're both past perfect elements. Then you are literally going, you are literally going into the past of the story. And there's a rule that I actually, well, not a rule, but there's a, a convention that I want to highlight here. We spoke about context earlier. If you're doing all of this in a paragraph that's all connected, you only have to use the had in the first sentence of the paragraph, the one that sets context for the rest that follows it. Because the reader will understand that, okay, we've gone into the past of the story and everything else follows there. And what that allows you to do is to cut out the had. So I'm going to read a paragraph that I have open on this. Nina had been a boss. So this is a description of somebody in the past of the story. Nina had been a barmaid, occasional source of information, and his lover. Farin and Yehan kidnapped her to bait a trap for him. Too slow to save her, he held her as she died. Her blood spilled over his hands, hot and red, onto the floor of the derelict warehouse in Somfa. So that paragraph is all set in the past of the story, and that is indicated by the single had in the first sentence. The reader knows that everything that follows is relating to that. And I don't have to have had. So the temptation for many authors, I think, is to put in, to, to say the following. Nina had been a barmaid, occasional source of information and his lover. Farun and Yehan had kidnapped her to bait a trap for him. Too slow to save her, he had held her as she died. Her blood had spilled over his hands, hot and red, onto the floor of the derelict warehouse in Somfa. To do my normal devil's, devil's advocate and mm -hmm. go be chaotic and go against the rule. I still think it's context. Um, mm -hmm. You can break rules, but you also have to do them because it's right. So like if I was writing that sentence it, or that paragraph, it would have two heads in it. Mm -hmm. Because the last part of it where he, he, is, he was too late to get there. Mm -hmm that could be mistaken for the now of the past tense story mm. because it is you know especially when you say the blood washed over his hands mm. like yes it happened before but i i don't want to i don't want to make take the chance of a reader misunderstanding so i would put a had in there mm. we're talking about two in a, in a pretty big paragraph so it's not yeah. like he had this so so another this also came up in last night's and but that but that's it exactly. Just before we go on to your because yours is a very relevant example, but it is there could there is space for another had in that sentence, but there isn't space for one in every sentence. No. That's going to be hella repetitive. And if the if the last descriptors wasn't written the way it is, mm. because it is it is really kind of in a moment, uh, because you kind of went from an uh a very you know mm. esoteric she, you know, she was a barmaid. She did get information. Mm. She was my lover. She got kidnapped. You know, like all those things are very esoteric and we're not going to give any details. Mm. The, the thing about the last two pieces of information that you're giving to the reader, those are details. And so because of the switch between an esoteric information and very detailed information, I would add a second head there because I don't want the readers to think, oh, wait, so he's holding her dead body now yeah. and the blood's washing on it. 100% right, that's the rule. It sh they should go, oh, well, there's a had in the whole thing. But, but they might not. Especially, especially yeah. readers in America, Americans be dumb. Yeah. And so I just don't want to do yeah. it. Um, so going, and now I've got a, uh, another uh, example of breaking that rule. Before I go there, mm. to emphasize what Marie just said, last night in the group, somebody had two hads in the same sentence. Basically, what you're saying is, you know, Drake had done this and then he had done that. There's, there's literally that, that, that second head is absolutely worthless. You know, Drake had done this and that. 
And nobody is going, especially considering it's in the same sentence, no one is going to, you know, misconstrued that this and that happened in the past. And I mean, the past before the past of the now. But there's also other ways that I like to do it. So here's, here's a piece from my current work in progress. We're just going to read this paragraph from, 60, from line 63 to 67. So pivoting, Clytus rotated to face his attacker. As he moved, his sword slipped free of its sheath with, the wisp, with a whisper of metal on leather. A steel saber forged by the essence during the War of Power, Doroshi stood a pace long. In addition to a finely etched guard and pommel, it held an edge so keen that it had never needed sharpening. He had rarely seen its equal. So first of all, I have two heads, but we started in the now of the past tense story for two lines, but it's the first time that the audience has seen his sword. They've seen the hilt, but this is, you know, chapter whatever, uh, chapter 10, and it's the first time he's drawn it. And it is very magical and it, it plays a central role in the whole story. And I want to give it, you know, I don't describe everything all at once. I like to dole it out, but I want to give its history. Technically, you could say, well, that's a little omniscient, but Clytus really loves his sword. And to me, maybe he did think about this at that moment. But it's not that it had never needed sharpening now. It had never needed sharpening from the beginning. Technically, the second sentence doesn't need it because he rarely found its equal is kind of implied we're talking about from the time he got the sword to the time he just drew it in this alleyway, getting ready to kill a bunch of guys. However, I don't like the way it reads. So, you know, it held an edge so keen it had never needed sharpening. He rarely found its equal. That doesn't sound right to my ear. I don't like it. Now, I could rewrite it. I absolutely could just rewrite it and not have a hat in there. But I'm also lazy and, and don't, I mean, it, it works for me. So. I have a second hat in there because to me, it doesn't sound right without it. And I always say this, follow the rules until they don't feel right. And then always go with your feeling. You could be wrong. That's, that's, a, that's a chance you're taking. That's a chance every author is taking on everything. You feel like the character is going to be, you know, connected by, by the readers, but you don't know. You feel that the story is gonna be exciting, but you don't know. You feel that you put a bunch of drama in it, but you don't know. Like everything we do is taking a risk. So I will add one other thing on had though. If you find yourself writing the words had had, seriously consider rewording. Like occasionally in my puke draft, had had will make its way in. But never beyond that. Because while it is grammatically correct, it, is. it makes it incredibly hard for the reader it to does. parse what you're trying to say. And it's if a reader struggles to parse, they're just going to skip over the sentence. And then that sentence is lost to them. And they might even put the book down. It's an awkward way to do it. Um, sometimes I've, I, I'm sure, I don't know this for a fact, I have to go look in at everything I've written, but I, I feel pretty confident to say that I've done it at least once in something. However, I probably did it with a contraction. So he'd had, instead of he had had, I would write he'd, possibly D, had. If I had to have two had hads mm -hmm. and I couldn't rewrite it, this was just the way I wanted to say, and there was nothing, there was no getting around it because he'd had a hard time getting a job is it really does sound better. It feels better when you're reading it than he had had a hard time getting a job. That's a very rough thing to read with the double hats. But when you don't really have two hats, even though you really have two hats because you've done it one as a contraction, you kind of can sneak it by. But I still, like I said, I'd have to go back through everything I've written yeah. because I'm the same way as Marie. If I if I've done a had had in, in my, my my puke draft, we'll just keep using that term. When I'm in editing mode and I hit it, I always go, Ugh. and I just I do whatever I can to get rid of it. And I don't think I've used it had had in any time recent. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have to go back pretty far in my past to find a had had. But again, 
contract one of them and you might be able to just squeak it by and no one notices. Um, okay, then you've got the comment there on the speech pattern. So before, before we get into this, I want to kind of preface it. Yeah. So because the next things that I'm going to talk about with this literally has more to do with consistency and feel than anything else. So none of this stuff is wrong that I'm going to talk about. None of it. These are opinions. Technically, everything's an opinion, but this is hardcore opinion. Adverbs, adjectives, verbs have weight to me. They mean something to me. So if we go back up to the um, sentence, he had a deep voice that fit his guttural accent. When I'm looking at his biblical Shakespearean speech, I would never describe that as a guttural accent. It doesn't, that descriptor in my mind clashes with what I feel like the dialogue is. And so, you know, again, it's not wrong. I just, to me, it feels wrong. So I wouldn't do it that way. So pay attention to that as you're doing that. And this is the same thing with the, the one, the comment that you're about to bring up is, uh, I did talk about the Shakespearean dialogue. And I said, this is going to be uh, a very difficult speech pattern to hold as well as one that's going to irk a lot of readers. So I, I do write accents in my fantasy stuff. I like writing accents in my fantasy stuff. I have lost readers because I write accents in my fantasy stuff. You know, I've had, I don't know what it is, but, but when I'm at a convention, every once in a while, somebody will come up to tell me how much they didn't like what I did. Like, I don't know why they came out of their way to, to let give me this information, but they felt compelled. And I'm like, oh, okay, thanks for the feedback. I'm not going to change it because the vast majority of my fans like it. But the vast majority of my fans like it because I really work freaking hard to do a balance of you can hear the accent in the dialogue, but it's not annoying to read. So I'm not saying change this. And I'm not saying this. This is I'm literally just using this as an example. I mean, Shakespearean, every, everybody should be able to keep up with this. The only thing I'm bringing up is, is that when you do give somebody a very distinctive speech pattern, you have to hold it every time that person talks. And you also want to make sure that it's in a way that doesn't kind of throw the readers out. So case in point, the, the main reason why I popped this is the spake. So spake isn't Shakespearean. It's actually Irish, I think. But I mean, it's a specific culture. Mm -hmm. So A, if this is a fantasy world that didn't exist in our world, they don't have an Irish. It might have been Scottish, but I'm pretty sure it was Irish. And I could have looked up what the actual Shakespearean. I think uh, the actual Shakespearean would be saith, thou art sure she be as she saith. Yeah, that might be it. Like I said, I didn't look it up, so that sounds right to me. Um, but spake. I'm going on all of the Shakespeare I've read more than anything else, so don't take my word for it, but I think it's saith. Well, spake threw me out because I'm like, that, that clashes. I don't feel like that's in Shakespearean, Old English, biblical, whatever you want to say, I don't feel like that's the correct word. And so I did just do a, um, a quick Google search on it. And like I said, I'm pretty sure I, it was Irish, but it was, you know, this is specific to this hmm. culture, nation, whatever. So you want to be very careful, especially if you're in a fantasy world. Um, we talked about this in a, in a previous podcast where you had a flower that you had named and you love the name. And then you found out the, the name of the flower is a dude's name. And you're like, well, that dude doesn't live in my world. So I'm not, I got to change this now. So be careful with that. Now, if this guy, if, if the you know, author's listening to this and going, no, 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 they're from Ireland, then awesome, great, perfect job. Mm -hmm. um, but it still threw me out. And then there's one last thing on dialogue. Oh, just, just, just one second. I see I, that there's a, down there, there's a, a thing that looks like a hyphen. That actually is a hyphen. And the hyphen is correct there between the eye. The only thing I would do is I would put, well, it's not, it doesn't, it, that shouldn't be an M dash is what I'm saying, because it's not an interruption. It's a person stumbling over an I. I, I sometimes use M dashes there. Do you? Because I, I want to show. hyphens on those. And that's fine. Cause that's yeah. a, with the hyphen, I'm going to read this. I, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, think to bring, like I'm stumbling over that to me when I'm trying to show something else to the reader or make them read in a different way, to me, when I do something like I M dash space, I, what that means to me is that they 
aren't just stuttering through it. They're going, I, I didn't know. Like there's, it, it forces the reader to kind of read a pause in there that, yeah. that so wouldn't exist. So I mean, that case would be a longer pause, but I think what they're trying to, what the, uh, the, re, the writer's trying to illustrate here is I, I. Right. Yeah. The only, I, I wouldn't have the stammered part in front because right. you don't need it. Right. Exactly. So yeah, that's, that's also a great point. Where I want to talk about consistency is this. I've seen her work. It impressed me but I've not seen her certificate of citizen black. Okay, there's that. But the same person also said, thank you kindly. And if you wouldn't mind, darling, thank you kindly. And mm -hmm. if you wouldn't mind, darling, because he even dropped the G, so I'm gonna read it, darling, is not in the same accent, tone, whatever, as Mr. Black, I've seen her work. Mm -hmm. it's, it impressed me, but I've not seen her certificate of citizen black. Like that is so formal and so much more intelligent or educated. I'm not necessarily intelligent because I know some country bumpkins because I'm from the deep South that are brilliant, brilliant people and they do not talk well at all. Uh, they know they, they know good English. So this threw me out too, because of the fact that you have this inconsistency with how this person talks. I'm like, okay, so they're, they're, they're kind of a, they're probably from the country. No, no, no. They're from the city. Oh wait, no, they're from the country. What the hell's going on? Where are they from? So not just when you pick something like, you know, I'm going to use Shakespearean for this guy's speech. That's how he talks. You know, maybe he is from the 1400s, 1300s. And I'm going to, I want him to sound like that. And so that's, he's never changed. Great. Be consistent with it. But it's also more than that. If you start using yas and dropping G's on ing words, then what you're doing is you're conveying a country-fied accent your American audience, and most of your audience is going to be American, is going to read that as a deep Southern, uneducated accent. Mm -hmm. They just are. So you, if you're going to choose these, these patterns, these speech patterns, you got you to stick to them. You got to hold to them. It's one of the reasons why, because I play with accents so much. I do one draft that I actually go through the, the, through the manuscript twice, you know, the, the chapters. I usually edit chapter by chapter. And I do a find and replace for all of my quotes. And I replace all my quotes with highlighted quotes. And then all I do, I do one draft where I'm looking for consistency. So I will just read all of one character's dialogue, just his, no one else's or hers. And I'm just looking, are they saying it in the same way? Are they they're holding their speech pattern? I've already got like a, a styles guide that I've written that, that is what I want them to do. And then I'll go through and read. Hmm. A second characters, whatever, because every one of my characters have different ways that they talk. And it gets really, really confusing when you're in the moment and you're writing. So I make mistakes all the time, but I don't want those mistakes to be read by the reader. So one of my drafts is just looking for consistency of speech patterns. And I, it takes me a while because I have to go through the whole chapter just reading character A's. And then I have to start at the beginning and go through the whole chapter just reading character B and then you know, so on and so on. I don't read any narration. Mm -hmm. Once I've fixed any errors and everybody sounds like what they should sound like, which is unique from everyone else. Uh, and when I say that, it's not so like I also choose like where people are from. So let's say I decide to give an Irish accent to this race of people that come from this area. They will all have that. And I really won't put any effort into changing that for secondary or tertiary characters. But if I have a POV character from that region, he will follow or she will follow all those rules, but I will also tweak it a little bit because I want to set them apart from the unwashed masses. I want that character to have something a little bit different. It's still the same Irish accent, if that's what I'm using, but there's one thing that they do that, that the others don't do. So that's one thing. And then the, the last draft that I do, the very last draft that I do, and I, so I, I do basically five drafts because I actually can combine the looking at uh, the consistency of speech pattern or speech patterns with this part of it. I do five passes through my edits and each one I'm looking for something completely different. So the very, very, very last thing that I do with everything still highlighted, I read the entire chapter only reading the dialogue. I don't read a single bit of an Irish. And the, the two questions that I'm asking as I'm going through it is, when I read a line of dialogue, I go, do I know who said that? 
Sure, I do, because their name's next or whatever. No, I didn't read any of that. Do I know who said that piece of dialogue just from the dialogue? I really do try, and you won't accomplish all the time. This is, this is something insane that I push myself for. But I really do want that to be a yes. I want readers to go, oh, yeah, no. You know, and, and sometimes it's a little word, sometimes a little, you know, whatever. You know, in, in the realm, my first realm story, one of the characters calls the POV lad. And the other guy that's with them does not call him lad. Like, just sim- simple little things like that. So if, uh, you know, if there's a dialogue line out there by itself and it says, well, lad, you shouldn't have done that. Like, everyone knows, because I've already set it up, that, you know, Arius is the guy who calls him lad. And he's the only guy that calls him lad. Then everybody's like, even if I don't put anything on that, I've done such a good job of making sure the readers know the speech pattern of Arius that they just say it in Arius's voice because they've been trained that Arius says lad. So little things like that are great. So that's the first question that I'm asking. The second question that I'm asking is, does the dialogue tell the story that I'm, does it convey the message that the scene is supposed to convey? So again, going down to that, boiling down a scene to what is this scene trying to accomplish? Not how is it written, but what's it trying? What's the message it's delivering to the audience? I want the dialogue to deliver that message all by itself. If you took out all narration and read it, you would still walk away knowing the gist of what happened, knowing the gist. Now, obviously a fight scene has no dialogue in it, so you're not gonna do, you know, be successful there. But I do want my dialogue to be very, very strong. So on this piece, is there a last kind of thing that you want to hit before we close it out? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> where did the bag come from? <laughs> um, so, but since you laughed at that, let's do that one. Um, and then we can end on that. So again, I'm reading this assuming that this is an opening of a chapter. So maybe the bag has already been described. Maybe the bag is already there. However, it's never mentioned before. It's just there uh, in, in the piece that I have. So the reason why I did it that way is just kind of show in case, because I also, what if, what if this is like the end of the chapter and yet still the bag was never mentioned? I call this the 400 foot of rope phenomenon where things just come out of nowhere. You have to plant this stuff. There has to be times where she throws the bag over her shoulder. It, it, she ca- the bag catches on a door frame. Like you, you, you look for ways to bring in these items so that when she's using it, it doesn't feel like it just she just materializes. it. So I wrote, you know, where the hell did the bag come from? Uh, is she some kind of wizard conjuring items out of the void? Because it literally came from nowhere. I, I would like to just um, hit the, the comment below it because that struck me as one of the things that I think that re- writers really need to learn to avoid. If the, the comment below, there's a, there's a piece of dialogue below it that says, uh, with this fresh canvas, I will map the city as I have done before from memory. I will mind race as I do so. My brush strokes will be quicker and my memory sharper than either of yours while I do this, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Now, If Mr. Anderson and Mr. Black know what mind racing is, then this is, as you know, Bob dialogue. It is describing something that they already know. Why are you telling them? And and the whole paragraph does this. And it feels very much like, as you know, Bob dialogue. Now, a better way to handle this would be to, in prose, describe what mind racing feels like what it feels like as she is mind racing. Don't bother to explain it. Just do it. Put it in the narration. Show the reader and tell and show the reader how that makes her feel. Does she love doing it? Does it expand her mind? Does it drop all the dialogue <laughs> and, and, and give it to us? So actually, I skipped down to the actual comment that, that it was because you're right. That's all up there. But the most egregious one was the almost the last sentence because she says basically she says i'm going to do this thing uh because i'm a mind racer and then it ends with if i could not mind race i could not focus on both nor could i react fast enough so basically what the i i wrote the message so the message is as you know if i accomplish the task that i'm about to do it means i can accomplish the task that i'm about to do and if i fail the task i'm about to do it means that i don't know how to do the task that i'm about to do that's literally what this this sentence kind of says and it's like, that's a really weird, like, 
thing to do. And then to tag on to what Marie said, the question I asked is, because she really goes into detail in dialogue to these two guys about what mind racing is. And so my question is, do these two guys know what mind racing is? Have they heard this term before? Because if they have, then all of that dialogue is not meant for them. They're meant for the reader. And I don't have my, my narrating characters talk to my reader. So you have to figure out a better organic way. Marie's example is great. If it's the first time that the readers are experiencing it, then let them experience it. Let them feel what it feels like to do this instead of, you know, telling them. But, but even if that's not what you're doing and they don't know anything about it, that last line is, is really, really rough for me. That, that that last line is very, very much like too much information, like yeah. way too overemphasized. Right. Well, also, it's it's also thanks, Captain Obvious, yes. just to bring up that one. I mean, because that's that's what's being said. If I can do this, then I can do it. If I can't, then I can't. Now, sometimes that actually works for story, And I've seen that. And I've never written it myself, but I've seen it in stories and movies where it's like, so I'm going to jump off this building and hopefully um, catch the wing of a, of a giant eagle as I, as I fall otherwise. And they're like, have you ever, you know, can you do that? And well, if I succeed, then I can do it. And if I can't, I'm dead. So that's more playing, you know, that's the character being sarcastic to the person who asked the question, can you do it? Or, you know, have, do you have the ability or whatever? Um, but this isn't that. This is literally, she's being serious in describing that if she succeeds and she can and if she doesn't then she can't mm. so it's it's all very obvious um even if mr anderson and mr black do not know what mind racing is so yeah you need to be cognizant of your sentences and i guess i don't do it so i don't look for it but i guess that's the third thing if you're going to follow me on my one draft or just dialogue I, I, another question that i that if you have this problem that you need to ask is Every time you read a line of dialogue, you ask yourself, is that information that is just for the reader? It's for nobody else but the reader. No one in the scene needs that information. It's sort of like, you know, at the beginning of our podcast recordings, I never say, all right, Marie, while we're doing our podcast, remember, you and me are humans and humans have to breathe air or we'll die. So make sure you're remembering to breathe as we're doing the podcast. Like that's that's an insane thing to say to somebody. Um, but it's really rife in fantasy because everyone, it happened last night. I know I keep doing that, um, but it is one of the things that I popped because uh, somebody stepped in my zone that normally doesn't. She normally writes in a different genre, but for whatever reason, last night she brought a, a fantasy piece and she did that. And I'm like, look, I know why you did it. Why you do it is because you're like, well, if I don't explain to the reader what this is, you know, I just threw, you know, chi Chiatluan at them. And that doesn't word doesn't need. So I have to explain what Chiatluan is, or they'll never get it. No, you can. They'll get it by what it does, yeah. or what it feels like. Give them context. Give the readers context. They will understand. Fantasy readers know that they're going to encounter weirdness, and they're like, "It's okay. Eventually, the text will explain it to me." Mm -hmm. You don't so. need to give them, as you know, Bob dialogue. They'll get yep. it. Okay, I think that's a good one. We've 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 probably gone over time a little bit. We have. If you would like for us to poke at your bear, um, your little baby bear, send us something at releasing your inner dragon at gmail.com. We're gonna do these as, as often as we can. We also want to talk about other stuff, but you know, this is supposed to be a podcast for writers. And I guess that's it. Yep. We will see you soon for another episode. Bye. <laughs>